Hello everyone. Now's the time where we look into the Word of God and see what he's got to tell us this morning through the riches of Scripture. Today, as uh, read earlier, we'll be looking at Philemon. It's only a short book, a personal letter, but definitely not a private one. One chapter, 25 verses, but so packed with riches and wisdom and love of the Lord. It presents a story of maturity and growth that provides an incredible example to Mimi, one that is so rooted in Christ as to be a model in itself for Christian living. It truly proclaims Jesus and his power to change from every word and utterance. It's a story of advocacy, forgiveness, restoration and releasing through obedience and adherence to Christ himself modelled on Jesus' example in life, death, resurrection and ultimate victory to both defeat the forces of darkness and with the power of the Holy Spirit to enable, embolden, equip, commission and send out to bear fruit, advancing the Lord's kingdom here on earth. Now in the short time we have together this morning I wouldn't presume to come up with any sort of definitive unpacking of the entire book and I'll urge you all go mining yourselves or better still in the company of others as there's so much more to be discovered in this wonderful wonderful book. We have three principal characters in the story we've got Paul who let's say he's the advocate he's advocating on behalf of others. We've got Onesimus the one he's advocating for, and Philemon, the recipient of Paul's advocacy, Paul's appeal. Let's have a look at Onesimus first. Even though you don't even get a mention till a bit later in the book after Paul has created a rapport with Philemon. Onesimus was a runaway slave who'd stolen from his master. Now, immediately we start making judgments there we start thinking in terms of a lot of what's been going on at the moment through the Black Lives Matter movement and the, uh, as you would say, the re not so much residue, but the, uh, the fallout from that. Please put to one side thoughts of Anglo-colonial slavery when we look at slavery in, in the Bible. We'll have a look at an, another time, another day into that, but that's not for now. What we need to know is that Onesimus had in effect broken the law and was on the run. Paul didn't take a side in this exchange between Philemon and Onesimus, nor attack the culture of the day advocating rebellion, tearing down of statues, manning the barricades and waving a flag. Now while Paul went with this was right to the nub to relationships between two people. Anyway, back to Onesimus. Somehow he'd ended up in Paul's company and was converted to Christianity. I think, first of all, there would have been some foundation laying preceding this, as he may well have heard Paul's name and teachings mentioned in Philemon's home. Now, taking from Paul Hiley's maxim that every contact leaves a trace, what caused this impression, a positive impression, we can say, on Onesimus within the Philemon household? One that meant he possibly sought out Paul, or at the very least, didn't avoid him. What drew Onesimus in? A home saturated with Christ, maybe. One where the gospel was lived out daily in the whole of family activities. Philemon, his wife and son, plus the whole church, met in their home, as is referenced at the opening greetings of the book. Could it be a home in which godly principles and a way of living were visibly practised, where tangible evidences of the fruits of the Spirit were shown and lived out? Those fruits being love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. I believe in Philemon's home we saw a real tangible living out of Christian life. Yet in this environment where Onesimus was, and for whatever reason he decided or maybe was driven or poor influences, 
to steal from his master and run off. He now has to suffer the consequences of being a runaway slave. He would have been cut off, a fugitive, disbarred, outlawed. If caught, he would be condemned to punishment, branding, possibly even death. If he'd had any type of trusted position in Philemon's house, that was gone. Who would ever trust a runaway slave again? It's quite possible that if they'd caught, the best he could hope for was a life, and a short one at that, of sapping, back-breaking labour in the mines, or as a galley slave. Thus, when ending up at Paul's doorstep, Onesimus was probably a desperate man. A fugitive from justice, hunted, hungry, penniless, having blown all which he stole, constantly watching his back, never trusting anyone. Someone he would most definitely avoid. A complete pariah. By the way, did you know that the name Onesimus means useful? But by his very act of running away from his master, he had become useless. To men, that is. Not to God, as we shall see. Paul, like Jesus, steps into the gap. So, this worthless man arrives on Paul's doorstep. Now, this would have been a considerable risk to Paul himself. Remember, he is currently under house arrest. So the chances are there would be guards stationed at the doors. Local justices may be looking in and out. Now, immediately as Paul acts on Onesimus' behalf by taking him in, he's taking a risk to himself. He's harbouring a fugitive. But either way, Onesimus stays with Paul. He becomes a Christian. In fact, not only a Christian, but Paul refers to him as my son. In the same way, Paul talks of Timothy, one of his closest aides, one who he trained up and shared so much with in advancing and spreading the gospel. Exalted company indeed. What a transformation, as we see in verse 11 of the scripture. Formerly, he was useless to you says Paul, talking to Philemon, but now he has become useful to both to you and to me. As John 1 verses 12 and 13 tell us, yet all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. It's like a springboard, an SMS conversion, a freeing off, firing out of the cannon, call it what you will. But under the loving tutelage and dis discipleship, grew, matured, developed and became almost indispensable to Paul. What an amazing transformation. Now the but. Paul recognises he can't hang on to an SMS. There's unfinished business to attend to, a wrong to right possible cloud hanging over Onesimus's future. It's time to face the music, do the right thing, whatever the potential cost. So he sends Onesimus back to Philemon, but not now as an escaped slave going back to face punishment and justice, but as a brother in Christ, and he advocates on his behalf. In verses 17 and 18, Paul says, Charge it to my account. Whatever he's wronged you, whatever he's done, whatever he's taken, charge it to my account. I will pay the price. That's not possibly not just monetary or fiscal loss or the loss of a valued worker, but the pain of loss. Maybe anger, indignation, shame, general inconvenience. Perhaps Philemon has become the subject of malicious gossip. People saying, oh, he calls himself a Christian, he can't even run his own household. It could damage the church. Accusations of bad management, you name it. But Paul doesn't even ask what. He just says, charge the lot to my account and I will take it upon myself. That so echoes Jesus' words in Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28. When he called his disciples together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, 
and their high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life, uh, life as a ransom for many. Paul is reaching out to Philemon on behalf of another, requesting forgiveness at what will mean a cost to himself. True advocacy. Through love, he appeals to Philemon. I think recognising too the need for Philemon to forgive. Not for Onesimus' benefit, but for Philemon's own. That no barrier may be established between him and the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, Paul calls us. We are ambassadors for Christ, he says, as though God was making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul not only calls on Philemon just to forgive and have things back as the way they were, but to take forgiveness to a new level onto a higher plane, be extravagant, be generous with forgiveness. Welcome him back as a brother, no longer a slave, but a dear brother. This is not merely a restored to former, glory, to former ways of relationship, but a totally transformed and renewed one. Exuberant forgiveness releases both the forgiver and the forgiven into new realms of service to our Lord. Praise be. Forgiveness sets you free. Wow. Just to finish out, as an example of how this forgiveness emboldens and enables and sets you free, around 110 AD, an early Christian leader named Ignatius, who was the Bishop of Antioch, wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus, about 100 miles from Colossae. In this letter, he addresses the Bishop of Ephesus many times repeatedly noting that the leader of the church in Ephesus was a man named Onesimus. Now, could this be the same Onesimus as the runaway slave? Evidence points to good reasons to think so. Philemon was written about 40, 50 years before. If, if, if as we assume, Onesimus was a young man in his 20s, then he would now be about the appropriate age for a bishop in the young, growing church. In the letter, Ignatius shows himself familiar with the letter to Philemon, and it is in those sections he mentions Onesimus by name, the part of the letter that echoes the language and substance of Philemon. Now, the New Testament scholar, F.F. F. Bruce, also suggests that Onesimus was instrumental in collecting and preserving the letters of Paul. If so, surely he was committed to include the epistle written on his behalf. What a story. Advocacy, forgiveness and restoration, all in obedience to Christ through his grace and mercy, through a former persecutor of the church, a runaway slave and his master, a slave owner, all contributing to the canon of scripture which God had determined. I urge you, brothers and sisters, pray and ask the Lord, seek out and search and pursue opportunities to advocate on others' behalf, to mediate, to arbitrate, to intercede, as Paul shows us, on the basis of love. Be prepared for it to cost. Forgive generously, extravagantly and without any preconditions. Exude the forgiveness that sets free and enables, equips and releases. Hold nothing back. When forgiven, rejoice. Be thankful, humbled, accept and embrace the freedom that forgiveness brings and allow the Holy Spirit to move you onto greater things. Grow in maturity, in faith, in deeds and action. All for the glory of God. The Christian walk, brothers and sisters, starts at the cross where the ultimate sacrifice was made, where Jesus stood in the gap for us, took our sins upon him without precondition, dying, defeating death, 
and then raising in glory from the dead that we can step in to new and greater works and rejoicing with him. Thank you so much for this morning. God bless you all.